Okay. Hello and welcome to the future, everyone. Before our intrepid explorers can go ahead, let's first have the crew. We are the Space Generation Advisory Council, a global network and voice for students and young professionals aged 18 to 35 interested in the space industry. Now, we were 27 people from six different project groups reorganized into four subgroups to address the competition's main subjects. Uh, we are 19 countries uh, across 10 time zones and one dream. Now that that's out of the way, let's jump straight in onto more pressing matters like questions. Questions like, is there life on Mars? And now I'd like you to take a few seconds to close your eyes and picture when we are. We are currently at a point where Mars aims to establish itself as a hub for innovation, for technology, and to augment interplanetary advancement. All the systems for life are in place and the 1 million people going to two cities are not initial settlers. That's all well, but what does life on Mars actually look like? Well, I can tell you right now, life on Mars is centralized over a concept of the promotion for self-actualization. There was a strong concept of having an aesthetics budget, so space and energy per capita dedicated to public spaces, viewing galleries, parks, outdoor environment simulation, sports areas, running water features, and when you step into your habitat, you have the power to modify your interior design through 3D printing technology. Now, understanding that the population will not all be explorers ready to embrace hardships and give up on all comforts, we have two key aesthetic drivers, uh, namely attraction and retention. Obviously life on Mars is not life on Earth and there are unique Martian aesthetics with windows and canyon walls, crater cities, indoor and outdoor simulated spaces that make you proud to feel like a Martian citizen. But now that we have a concept of citizenship, how does that actually work? We could take a quick look at the governance model on our cities. We are looking at a three-body system of governance with a direct democracy integrated with artificial intelligence, no, AI, driven governance. Now the driving principles are twofold, uh, number one being technological advancement and number two, innovative capacity building. Let's take a quick look at what these three bodies actually are. We have the Mars Council, a group of officials uh, bought into power via a ranked voting system, whose responsibility is to uphold the constitution by taking in public voting into law whilst assessing the viability of the results and communicating the same. You also have the public or the citizens who have access to public referendums with debate and discussion on any topics that come up for a public vote. Now, the public also has an independent audit of the government's performance. And we have our cherry on top with the AI or the artificial intelligence that requires data collection from sensors and biological markers all around the settlement. Now, the AI administration includes grassroots level law enforcement. So that's tax collection, any office that requires certification and licensing, basically the overall functional and operational management of the colony. Now, the AI is a tool for dispute resolution and overall our system can be summarized as an AI executive branch for a human judiciary. Now, the system may sound labor intensive and slower, but it avoids a concentration of power and promotes transparency. It's more fair and equal in the long run. And what we are focused on is sustainability. Now, if we step back and consider external environments, the government will have a passive military capability. And since the colony's vision is technological excellence, it in itself counts as an export. And the goal is to use trade as a tool for diplomacy when it, when it comes to external influencers. So trade will serve as a means to maintain peaceful bilateral and multilateral relationships. Now, that's a perfect segue into trying to understand what the economic model of on Mars is. Now, 
the main purpose of the economic output is to position Mars as an innovation hub and production and supply base for human settlements deeper into the solar system. Now, as a medium of exchange, we envision the introduction of a blockchain-based cryptocurrency introduced by an independent central bank. Now, this hybrid system of market freedom and uh, governmental regulations complements this goal of where we want to put Mars in the overall supply chain. And as we see here, the key economic indicators are research and development expenditures. And to take that further, let's look at where we are. Now, it is a known fact that we are a self-sufficient colony. And as a result, export of scientific data, intellectual rights, technology, and R&D are the key focus for revenue generation. As a result, we are a reinforcing the idea of state investments in R&D and welfare social programs to also attract incentives for local and foreign investors. These activities in themselves play a critical role in overcoming any of the restricting factors of the harsh Martian environment, and once again, play a role in securing a sustainable Martian economy. Now, together with government spending, we come to approximately $32 billion on R&D overall and about $27 billion return on investment from just the private sector alone. Obviously, for revenue, we are also looking at tourism and trade and the, the use of mining asteroids. But as you can see, with our goals and where we want to head, turning Mars into such an industrial-driven society corresponds to a certain social structure. So we see a majority of the population being production designers, technological innovators, creative engineers, and as a result, the state-provided social welfare programs will in turn allow people to form and re rekindle that unique Martian identity that can help everyone move towards that shared goal. And once again, it's always important to step back and look at where it falls in the overall supply chain. And just to reiterate, we're looking at making Mars a refueling base and developing all those technologies by collaborating with Earth and lunar colonies and Captain also Powell. developing a, sorry, pardon? Okay, um, I can take any questions after. Uh, development of a fleet, of satellite networks for the communication hub. Now that we've talked about what life is like, how it is and why it is, it might be important to look at where we are. And for that, we have a map of the settlement locations. Now I mentioned earlier that we are spread around two major cities. We do have the uh, three main lava tubes at Hadriacus Mons, and we also have Terra Samaria and Terra Serenum. Now I'll go over why we picked them as I describe the cities. We have the lava tubes. Now the lava tubes can hold about 25,000 people and that's considering all the ergonomic factors. And obviously the lava tubes being lava tubes have the fun added feature of protecting sensitive equipment from solar winds or cosmic radiations. So we see the lava tubes being cities centralized around research and research utilization. Now, the city plan itself would be a linear city plan, also seen in a lot of human settlements. You have transport and supply lines running through the middle and strips of development giving equal access to services and spaces. Now, that's not all the 1 million people. So we have 975,000 people in our crater cities. So we've chosen Terra Samaria and Terra Serenum because of the local, local magnetosphere that serves as a radiation shield. So we're attenuating about 50% of the radiation and we have the highest atmospheric pressure that we could have. Now the city themselves would furrow into the crater walls and we'd have additional radiation shielding provided by a transparent polyethylene membrane roof or as we like to call it an ice dome. Now our calculations show that a 40 centimeter thick layer should be sufficient and that lets in that glorious wonderful light in as well. For the city design, we are considering a radial city design with concentric rings of development, the inner being the industrial and government regions, 
the middle being commercial, recreational, and research areas, and the residences on the outermost rim. Once again, making sure that you have equal access to resources. So basically, when you're on Mars in any city, you're always downtown. Now, within the cities you're getting around via a rail system or electric vehicles, and should you want to travel and sightsee to another city, you go via gas hoppers that use uh, atmospheric methane as propellant, or if you want to send over care packages, you can use our array and network of AI-driven drones to transport goods. But when we start talking about communication and making all of this possible, it's important to look at one often overlooked uh, technology base for all of this. And that's where we come to MConnect, our Mars communication system. Consisting of 60 low orbital small satellites using a combination of RF and optical communication systems to set up deep space communication between Earth Mars systems and local systems. Now, the M Connect is used between users for teleeducation, telemedicine, communication between the drones, virtual reality, virtual tourism visits, communication between the transportations, IoT connectivity, and most importantly, machine learning. And the drones themselves would use M-Guide or the navigation system, a 24-hour continuous navigation system that is formed by 18 satellites and six circular orbital planes. Now, when it comes to people, the accuracy is about up to one millimeter, and the system makes autonomous corrections for the lava tubes. And a fun fact to note, every Martian citizen will have receivers with atomic clocks to avoid time corrections. Now, the, the applications for this system include uh, the drones to monitor remote locations um, for transport management, delivery services, but a key factor it can be used for is disaster management. And since I've mentioned our goal to make sure we create a sustainable co colony, one of the key features is MI. Now, our remote sensing system consists of six satellites to monitor the habitat, equatorial, and polar regions. The idea is to use sensors for all weather imaging, uh, tracking climate change, tracking air temperature, humidity, surface temperature, vegetation, ice sensors, biomass overviews, atmospheric carbon dioxide, because the idea is that we want to understand how human presence affects growth and how we grow along with the growth we're trying to induce. Now, apart from the remote sensing system, we also have planetary defense covered with our near Mars object detection system with a satellite based and ground based detection system and a satellite based asteroid redirect system. Now, I know we all love looking into the sky, but let's take a step back and look at what the city is like. When we look at comfort, it is important to talk about our environmental control and life support system. Now, the ECLSS we have is a semi-centralized system with 2,500 independent nodes, each capable of providing uh, pressurized air, disposing waste, providing water from the polar ice caps, uh, and oxygen via the saboteur process to about 120 four-person households. Now, the nodes themselves form a network, and in the case of a single point failure, five other nodes can take over and provide backup. Now, according to our calculations, we have 3,000 hospital beds for a million population distributed proportionally between a centralized tertiary care hospitals and community ambulatory centers. Now, on Mars, it's important to know that the permanent monitoring of environmental parameters that can affect the population's health, both in and outside the city, is critical because it is important to stay ahead of any potential threat, and we intend to use scientific data for predicting and mitigating disaster effects. Speaking of which, calculations show that the risk for medical emergencies uh, in the general population is about 0 0.06 events per person per year. So we are prepared to handle about 60,000 medical emergencies per year. And we can do that because we have a powerful backbone. What we have designed is a rigorous and robust 
power system, which includes a reserve equivalent for 30 days. Now, our main source of power will be geothermal plants, and a supplement to that would be biogas plants. Now, we have nuclear plants as just a worst case scenario backup. Now, since we are talking about resources in general, and since we have the confidence that we can hold and operate everything, let's take a very quick speed run through all the resources and the management that we have in our colonies. For, for food, we have aquaponics, farming technology. So that's combining aquaculture, that's rearing aquatic animals with hydroponics. So that's cultivating plants and water in a symbiotic environment. It is sustainable in the long run. Now, when it comes to waste management, we have dedicated compact biogas plants for every 20,000 to 50,000 people. And we are looking to generate about 63,500 kilowatt hours of electricity per day. Now, when it comes to biohazardous waste, they can either be inactivated using ionizing radiation, um, decomposed and then recycled, or else it will be incinerated. Now we can take a quick ping to mining, which is again twofold because number one, we are looking at mining regolith. Now we can mine regolith to build regolith bricks, which again work on to expanding our settlements because they are excellent in attenuating radiation and providing that shielding we so need. Uh, up next, we also have C-type asteroid mining, which we intend to use uh, in orbit processing facilities for. More details are listed in the report. Up next, a key factor we have is the pharmaceutical resources. Now, while we have uh, the use of genetic engineering, the idea is to focus on research and development for studying and testing potential therapeutic molecules under Mars conditions. So we're talking about developing and validating uh, new drug models, uh, manufacturing techniques and production and distribution techniques in the Martian environment. So until we sustain more growth, and then once we start growing in the solar system, this would be the model that we end up replicating. Now, we have looked into the future, so it's time to take a pause and stay in the present. We could look at the pale red dot, a vision of the human future in space, and what's been presented is presented by a voice of the youth in space future. What we have is not a project, but a promise to continue to collaborate, cooperate, and create a unique sociocultural space identity whilst working within realistic economic models inside a robust, multi-tiered and multi-skilled technological framework, of course, packaged in a way that hits space exploration passion. And for this, before I hand over the floor for questions and answers, I would like to give a huge shout out to the SGAC team for coming together in such a short time and giving their best. And of course, from all of us, a huge shout out uh, and big thank you to all the SGAC leaders and co-leaders from the project teams who put in a lot of hours of effort to make sure that this happens. And with that, I will stop talking and open the floor up for any questions. Go ahead, Manosis. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Team 4. I congratulate you for gathering all this huge team. Uh, that is something really important and necessary for uh, Mars. My questions are actually three three parts. The first one is uh, comment on your choice of transportation to take all the gear you need to Mars and then the time you need to build the city. And the third part of the question is the time to multiply the city to cities as to relieve the pressure of, of overpopulated Earth. Thank you. Thank you so much for those questions. Um, I will try to answer both 
of the, of the first and second ones together, and then we'll go about the other. So for getting to Mars and essentially sending over transport stages with the required equipment, we are looking at the Starship and we had in mind uh, docking station transfers. So we're looking at, um, let me just grab my notes here really quick. Uh, we're looking at a system of uh, in-orbit and ground station uh, spaceports that can be used to sort of hop around. And for long haul transports, we're looking at um, more higher uh, or lower TRL at the moment uh, propulsion technologies. We have a short optimized breakdown of the, the design space that we had. But at the moment, we are looking at the turn of the century to make that all possible. To get that docking infrastructure in place or even to get long haul uh, transport stages, like fast transport stages developed to a suitable and usable TRL, it's going to take the turn of the century. And when it comes to addressing how long the expansion takes place, the idea is that once they get started, once we have the ground infrastructure, then we're looking at very fast growth, very fast growth of expansion, and we can start getting people up to Mars super fast, get them settled in. But definitely that initial setup and build phase is a uh, currently longer time scale. But to be co totally conservative, we are looking at the turn of the century, but should funding and sociopolitical conditions work out, it would be faster, so in about 70 years. <laughs> I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my notes. Hi, uh, my notes. Victoria, why don't you go? Okay. Um, Abhishek. Uh, yeah, I, uh, so I had a question about the social, cultural, and political aspects. Like, have you thought about that? And could you uh, speak a little bit about that? Thank you. Sure thing. Um, so we definitely um, are focused on having a direct democracy. But if I understood your question right, it's more of the grassroots level cultural implications. From what our discussions were and our brainstorming sessions were, the, I the idea of creating the identity will be focused on that drive to innovate, that drive to technologically innovate. So all the cultural aspects and all the cultural nuances of the community would end up being focused around more of a technical system. So you have uh, a lot of thinkers creating that sort of thinker identity. Uh, I hope that was the question. Uh, if it was more of a governance model, then it's we're focusing on a very simple direct democracy system. But in terms of culture and cultural expression, the idea is to genuinely zero in on technological innovation and creativity from a technical standpoint. Okay. Victoria? Hi, so that was a great presentation. And my question is about your energy plan. Uh, I'm really curious how you guys came to the conclusion to keep nuclear as a backup and to use biomass as your main power source. Sure thing. Um, so our top uh, power source is still geothermal because from a sustainability standpoint, geothermal energy is what we're looking at for the long haul. And that's from our discussions, that's something for interplanetary scale development. Um, we are looking at having uh, geothermal like potential on Mars about 100 uh, miles away from NASA's uh, Curiosity rover at the moment. And like with the low gravity and the atmospheric conditions, we are actually thinking that the process of extracting the geothermal energy would work out more efficiently than on Earth. And again, a lot of proposals for creating energy or getting that power supply on any planet that isn't Earth focus on using solar or nuclear, but the idea is that we're talking about sustainability. And in the long run, um, geothermal is honestly our 
best bet. Um, it's not possible to have large scale um, like nuclear plants and um, well, with, with like geothermal like heat or electricity generated from steam turbines, we're, we're going back into uh, a very strong and fast paced human development phase of the whole industrial revolution. But five um, minutes to time's up. Five oh, minutes. Sorry. All right. Um, but yes, uh, geothermal and biogas are more sustainable in the long run. And uh, if, considering that you can't really use wind energy, uh, RTGs don't really work as well. Again, when you're talking about a scale of 1 million people. So from a practicality point for long term, uh, large scale settlements, geothermal is our best bet. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Kyle, it's your turn. Hi there. Um, I, I think you kind of touched on this in terms of the geothermal. So I was going to ask you a different question. Um, so you're, uh, it seems like you're, the location of your uh, settlements are based on uh, those lava tubes and um, dealing with, I think you said radiation. Um, how are the water sources available where you are planning on landing? Um, are you in the more northern latitudes where there's lots of pure ice? So, um, so I had to like go over this super fast when I was presenting, but essentially for water, what we are looking at, uh, just in general, because we want it to have a um, geographically independent system to the um, water. For water, we had a system of um, rovers equipped with microwaves that could melt the polar ice caps and send pipelines over. So our this particular location settlement was sort of independent of that because we already had a prototype system for rovers that could handle the melting and transportation of water via pipelines that could in turn create that network of settlements that fill in that area in the future. I hope that answered the question. George? Um, thank you. So my question is about the dome. Uh, um, what is the diameter of the dome and uh, what will the ambient air pressure be inside? And, uh, you know, the, will people walk around in, uh, in spacesuits or in, in shirts in the dome? Sure thing. Now, I am not sure if I can call upon uh, some of the representatives from the technical team who I see on the chat here, but I can answer that question. I don't have the numbers exactly off the top of my head, but the environment inside will be regulated. Uh, people don't need to wear suits inside. The temperature will also be regulated. So we're talking about casual clothing. People can walk around and experience the, the city as they would do on a normal uh, city on earth. The actual numbers uh, escape me at the moment. Uh, my brain's not bringing them up, but they are in the report and please feel free to email me or I could actually email you the answer um, as, soon as, as soon as I get done. Sorry about that. Uh, I, ho I hope it answered. I can answer another question. No, um, that's fine, thank you. Thank you. Sure. Abhishek? Abhishek, oh, I, I, I already uh, asked my question, it was about deep political stuff. Please, please lower your hand if you've asked a question, man. Uh, Manuel. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, very good. So um, I have a couple of questions, but I think this is probably the last one, so I'll, I'll be quick about it. You talked about the original uh, colony and then you indicated the fact that there would be a Martian constitution with some degree of self-governance. I begin to understand, how do you foresee the transition from an Earth-controlled colony into self-determination and how then prevent, so to speak, Earth's political influence from major nations, as well as many external factors from both commercial and governmental factors from Earth? That's an excellent question. And that is one of the key challenges that we identified when we were going ahead with this brainstorming. And when we were trying to come up with uh, not a draft per se, but an outline of what that constitution 
would have. It is definitely a challenge when you're starting to create a new identity and when you start talking about a new interplanetary identity that becomes more convoluted. What we did have a quick discussion about was instead of something like the Artemis Accords, we'd have an Aries Accords where nations on Earth also go ahead into agreements that they will not force their hands up. Thank you. Time's up. Thank you for that.